uh, one thing that you've uh, um, left out is the fact that we changed directions. You started That's true. off in yes, Surrey. Yes, I was at Surrey, to, and then and I moved, moved to, to the East of Cancer Research, and then you moved to Surrey. I, I yes. moved, <laughs> and the two facts are not related to each other. That's <laughs> very important to point out. We're very good friends. <laughs> Thank you, Dimitri. I'd like, to, I'd like to thank the organiser for the opportunity to come and talk to you today. Now, uh, I'm going to take a slightly different approach to um, the speakers that you've had so far, because what I want to do is really focus on a specific project as an exemplar. Now, we, we have, you know, um, amongst us, we, we have people from industry, um, from health service, and uh, from universities. And uh, this is a project, this is an example of bringing uh, people from those disciplines together. Hence the, you know, the intention to use this as an exemplar. So I'm speaking really on behalf of the whole consortium and on behalf also of those I, I've worked with in the, in the past on the projects that, that led to this. And, and quite a few of them are in this room. So if I say anything wrong, please sort of, you know, stand up and correct me. So the background then, well, Pravda is um, an international and national, what I mean by international and national, as well as um, having international partners, there are many groups from the UK contributing to that, bringing unique expertise to this. And the purpose of it is to develop imaging methods and instrumentation for proton therapy. And what we're trying to do here is always, I think, of uh, technology readiness levels and translational research. We're trying to take basic engineering, physics, etc., and apply them to outstanding medical problems. And of course, to do that, we need to get the right people. So we're trying to bring together the key partners with the uh, key skills to address these challenges. So um, first of all, let's consider proton radiotherapy. So proton radiotherapy is a big investment in the UK. There are two national NHS centres being built at the moment at UCLH and Manchester, and there are a set of private centres. Now, proton radiotherapy is seen, I think, in the UK as a, a sort of a big new technology. Um, a range of proton centres already exist around the world, and proton radiotherapy is really taking off. There's a lot of investment there. And I think many people working in proton radiotherapy would agree with me that in terms of imaging to make sure the treatment is correct and accurate, the technology often lags a little bit behind what we have in more conventional X-ray radiotherapy. So we want to image the proton beam uh, to make sure the treatment is correct. And ideally, we'd like to use uh, the proton beam. And this slide tries to illustrate why we want to do that. So we could take CT and we can uh, take our CT scanner and we can relate the intensity in our CT scanner to stopping power of our protons. So the dose delivered by CT, by CT scanner is dependent depend on the attenuation coefficient mu, uh, which uh, at Compton energies for the CT scan is um, electron density. So this Hounsfield unit, if you like, is something like electron density. Protons interact differently. We have the stopping power of the protons, and that is, if you like, summarized in the z-axis there. So first of all is a sort of calibration curve relating one to the other, and then sort of looking in more closely at different types of tissue. It's a fairly complex picture, potentially. So this is why we want to image with protons, that we, we don't have, if you like, the uncertainty in these points here. Now, there are if you like, this, this is the caveat in the talk. There are competing technologies to do that. Dual energy CT, multispectral CT. I'm not saying this is necessarily an alternative to, to those. Well, it's an alternative, sorry. I'm not saying that this is better than those. What we have to do, uh, I think, as a community, is develop these technologies and evaluate them and compare them. So, but this is, if you like, this illustrates why we're interested in imaging with the proton beam. And this slide tries to illustrate, if you like, or to summarize the, the challenges in terms of accuracy. Radiotherapy, if you like, is all about accuracy. It's about getting the dose um, ex as accurate as we can where we want it to, to go. And we know that we can't do that perfectly. So we often handle that by having margins for error in our treatment. And 
this illustrates if we have, if you like, zero uncertainty in the delivery of dose from, from these sort of two proton beams coming from the side compared with a, an underestimate of three and a half percent and an overestimate of three and a half percent. You can see the, the color wash where the high dose goes looks quite different. And what we're saying here is that we think we can get the current uh, description, if you like, of accuracy with these approaches using standard imaging is about three and a half percent. So if we have a 20 centimeter thickness of tissue to pass through, we're talking of about seven millimeters accuracy there. What we're trying to do by imaging directly with the proton beam, remove the uncertainty in that calibration, is actually to get a much better accuracy. And we, you know, ideally we'd like to get something like 1% or 2%, you know, of the order of a couple of millimeters. So that, if you like, would be the, the sort of real sort of uh, dream of, of doing this kind of work. But this illustrates, hopefully, the, the purpose of this. So how are we going to do that? Well, we want to take a CT scan, and protons and X-rays behave very differently. So if we're taking an X-ray CT scan, to a crude approximation, the way a, an X-ray CT scan works is that we fire lots of X-rays into the patient, um, and some get through to the other end and some don't. So it's a sort of a, a, a not quite binary, but a selection process. I, I know we get scattered photons still get into the detector at the other end, but to a good approximation, what's happening here is with the attenuation of the beam, um, these X-rays, some of them get through to the other end and some don't. So that's okay. They travel effectively in straight lines, um, which helps in getting a good image quality. Um, but if we wanted to get the best image with the best statistics, we wouldn't actually want a, a particle that either um, sort of gets through or disappears. The binary selection isn't necessarily the best way to do it, if you like. So what happens with protons? Well, protons basically travel straight through. If we give them enough energy so they pass through the patient, a proton is 1, 8, 3, 6 times the mass of an electron. It bounces around with the electron inside the patient's body and comes out the other end. So that's really good in a sense because every proton gets through to the other end, that's good. And it tells us what happened all along its path effectively. It's integrating for us the interaction in its path. So that's, that's what we want um, to, get, to give us our projection so that we can reconstruct our image. So that's good. We use the phrase, every proton tells a story, if you like, to summarize that. But because the proton is interacting with these electrons, each one deflects it, but not by much. So it bounces around a little bit. And by the time it's got to the other end, it's deflected by a few degrees. That's not great, you know. We have a, a slight blurring, if you like, in, in our data. So we have to deal with that. So this illustrates the general concept of how we do that. So we measure where the proton's traveling into the patient or phantom. We measure where they're coming out. So we get a path in and a path out. That's the first requirement, if you like, to work out um, how much tissue the, um, the proton's gone through and the effect of the tissue. We measure that. And then we have RERD is residual energy range detector. So this is measuring how much energy the particle has at the end. So we know how much it had at the start. We know how much it has at the end. We can try to infer from the path in and path out uh, which bit of the patient it's gone through. So from that, we've got an integral of attenuation through between those two points. So we've got the conditions we need to construct a CT scan, as long as we do that from enough positions and enough orientations. So that's the, the basic idea. And generally, the approach to proton CT around the world now is to use something like this. So this measurement of what's... Oh, sorry, I'm pressing the wrong buttons here. Too many buttons. So measuring what's going in and what's coming out. So this, remember this, we'll come back to sort of implementations of this diagram a bit later. So proton CT seems very new, very exciting, but it's like all, all of these great technologies, the original idea goes back a little way. So this is from 40 years ago, 
looking at imaging with alpha, alpha particles with a, a system that, again, looks somewhat similar to what we've described. And that shows, I think, for 40 years ago, a really nice uh, quality image from that approach. Also, Cormac, who won the Nobel Prize for, with, with Hounsfield for developing CT in his seminal paper, talked about uh, using hadrons as a means to get the best CT images for the reasons we've just looked at. So this is the system again. This is how we might implement it, entrance exit detectors and a calorimeter or something like that to measure the total energy. But we have a problem because they don't travel in a straight line. We've got a path here and we've got a path there. We need to join up the dots, if you like, to work out what they've done in the middle. And what the best we can do is something like an estimate of the most likely path. There are variants on this where we can try and work out a probability envelope, but it, in a sense, boils down to the, to the same approach. We've got to estimate what's happening here, and of course the actual path might be that sort of complex grey path there. So we get uh, something that gives us limited information, if you like, fundamentally, about what's happened between uh, our entrance and exit paths. So going, if you like, from ancient history, not quite ancient history, old history to more recent history, um, this table just illustrates the uh, amount of activity out there. There are various groups listed here and, you know, when they're active, what they've done. And there are a whole range of approaches here, both to tracking and to working out the energy of the final particle. So there are scintillator-based calorimeters to estimate the energy of the final particle, um, plastic scintillators, that sort of thing, and a range of detectors from SSDs, gem detectors, and um, strip detectors to uh, work out what's, uh, what's the path in and out of the patient. So there's a, you know, there's a whole lot of activity here. What I'd like to do now is really focus on the technology we've applied for, for this project. And what we're trying to do specifically is to build a solid state only system. Can we use purely effectively silicon to solve this problem of image reconstruction? And this all started uh, back some years ago with uh, an EPSRC project to develop um, CMOS technology. And this, if you like, was the foundation of all of this. And Renato will recognise a lot of these detectors that are built by his group uh, at RAL. And these are exploring, if you like, various aspects of CMOS technology. But they also provided test systems to apply to some of the biological and medical imaging problems that we had. And that led to a second project called uh, MI3 Plus, imaginatively, so it had a plus to the end. And this built on that technology. So one, we used one, this detector was actually from the previous project, but we used this for uh, some of our demonstrator experiments with protons. Also came out of this developed by um, Thales Xagoras and his colleagues was uh, something called the dynamite detector. So we have great names for these detectors. This is the dynamite detector that um, also allowed us to, to do some of these measurements and sort of built on that technology. So we, this is an experiment taken at the uh, Proton Center at Boston using the, um, so this is called the large aerial sensor or LAS using this sensor really to illustrate that with sensible doses and fairly simple setup, we you know we can image proton beams and we can get radiographic type images. So that was a you know, quite important result. This detector dynamite we used um, throughout the, the, the sort of later stages I'm going to show you. And every talk should have a set of, of key take home messages. And one from this uh, talk is don't call your detector dynamite because if you're trying to send it abroad to get it packaged, it can get held up in customs because they see the name dynamite, they get a bit worried. I think that's true, isn't it, Marcus? <laughs> so be careful how you name your detector. 
so these, but these two projects provided uh, both the, the, some of the initial technology to evaluate um, uh, CMOS-based imaging in protons, but also provided the detector technology in, in, the, in terms of this to allow us to sort of do the next stages of the work. So those are two strands, if you like, of the detector technology. The third is by uh, Phil Orport and colleagues developing strip detectors for imaging therapeutic proton beams. So Clatterbridge is a, a national proton center that delivers protons of, I think it's uh, 62 MeV. Um, so 62 MeV is a high enough energy to penetrate about a centimeter or so of tissue. So that's used for things like ocular cancer treatments. And what they've done here is to place this, uh, this system, so it looks like, if you like, a, a halo of strips. They've put this in the proton beam and measured dynamically um, as the beam is delivered, what is the position of the beam. So the idea is if, if at this edge here everything is, is symmetrical, you've got the same sort of spillover, then the beam is nice and centered. So we, we took those two types of technology um, as the basis for, for doing this, and we applied to Wellcome for funding to, um, to take this forward, and the logos of various um, parties contributing to the project are listed here, and those are the four of us who went to do the presentation, you know, whatever, to, to get this funded. So that's the, if you like, the genesis of the project and the full list of, of partners are listed here. So again, we have a combination of universities, NHS partners, IE healthcare partners and industry. And, you know, this, I think this is very important for this kind of project to, to make something of this sort work. And the sort of concept of how we're going to use these is illustrated here. So we have something that measures the position of the beam. Um, so first of all, this, the idea of this is this is before the patient comes along. So it's basically checking everything's going to be correct. The beam is as we want it. So we measure the position of the beam as it comes out of the uh, treatment nozzle, as it's called. So we can use our strip technology to do that. We might measure it down here again to, to make sure that we know the path of our particles and then we have um, a, a phantom that has inside it a, a sandwich of pixel detectors so these will be CMOS detectors and the idea is we can really verify the the range or the depth at which the the proton beam travels so that gives us a basic calibration that the beam energy is what we think it is amongst other things I press the wrong button again so that's the, if you like, one mode of the instrument, and two other modes are shown here, and these are sort of during treatment or during treatment setup. The second of them, which I think is the most challenging thing, is to do the proton CT. So we turn the energy right up, so we pass, the beam passes through the patient. Again, we measure with our strips, entrance and exit position, and then with our CMOS sandwich, we measure... Um, how far the particle travels and hence its residual energy. So that's with the patient in place and before they're treated to allow us to do a proton CT scan. So we have to do this from lots of different directions to satisfy the criteria for proton image, uh, sorry, for tomography. But that's the basic idea of what we do from each direction. Then the patient is treated. We still have this detector here that measures the position of the, the spot coming out. So we have, again, something that's an online verification that as the beam delivers its dose, that it's, it's actually still correct with every, measuring every aspect that we can from the, the beam as it enters the patient. So that's the, the basic idea of this. We've got these three complementary modes of operation. So again, just to really focus on the detector technology, so we have our strips here as entrance and exit. So what we have is, first of all, 
entrance, we have two lots of these. So to get a vector, if you like, we have to measure two points. So we have to have a pair of them to give us our position going in. And the same for the position going out. Now, each of these is made up of X, U, V direction strips. So the idea is we've got three lots of them overlapping. So when the two strips cross, if you like, we... Well, imagine my finger is one of the strips. If we only had one strip, it hits my middle finger. We, all we know is it's somewhere, it's, it's down here. We don't know where it is along here. If we do that from two directions, in principle, we get the position. If we actually use three, then we're, we're a bit more um, resilient to having pile up of, of, of signals. We can st more easily still separate uh, events if we get more than one striking our strips. Then we have our range telescope, and the idea here is to have about 24 of these CMOS detectors that effectively are, are imaging, they're creating an image. The strip is sort of giving us a little blip, if you like, at very fast rate when we get um, a particle passing through, a proton passing through. So this will ideally see individual protons, and these will sum up over several protons, but we we still have a sparse enough field so that we can separate them and relate them to the strip signal. That's the basic idea of the, of the system. So our, our proton radiotherapy centre partner in this was Etemba Labs in, in Cape Town in South Africa. So um, we were forced to go to Cape Town to do this experiment. It was, you know, you have to do these things. Um, also, Birmingham, uh, they, they've got a, a nice cyclotron centre there. That, so their cyclotron goes at a, up to about 36 MeV. Itemba, it's about 200 MeV, which is a, a big enough energy to deposit a, a substantial dose fairly deep in the human body. So, they, you know, they do proton treatments there. So the first thing, again, it, is basically how do the detectors look? So this is using Thales's dynamite detector and what we've... Got here is again, we've designed a phantom with various characteristics, and we've imaged that phantom just in integrating mode to show you know we can get sensible uh, signal to noise ratio with these devices. So that was an important first proof of principle. The next thing we want to do, of course, is if this is going to work, we, we've got to be able to separate individual protons. And that means we have to be able to see a single proton in, in our system. And this, this probably doesn't look very exciting, but we were very excited when we saw this. This little strip here, well, first of all, this is, if you like, the, a strip, a narrow window across the sensor going very quickly. If we focus in on a bit of that, you can see some white blobs. Now, each of those is an individual proton, so that shows the system basically works. We have to prove, of course, that it's an individual proton and not noise. Well, first of all, you have a, a finite size field, of course, so inside the field you see events, you don't see them outside. That's evidence piece one. Secondly, you know what the beam current is, so you can calculate how many events you should see. We've confirmed that. The third piece of evidence is here. What we can do is to place different thicknesses of PMMA in front of our sensor. So the proton deposits dose in a, in a Bragg peak. So the thicker the piece of PMMA, the, the lower energy it's got when it strikes the detector, the lower the energy, the more of its energy it will depart in a thin layer. So we sh as we increase the thickness, we should get a signal that basically increases to a maximum and then decreases. And this is a comparison between the direct measurement and simulation of what the data should look like. So we're fairly confident this shows that the, the system is capable of seeing individual protons. I mentioned the sort of challenge of relating the... Um, the information that, that, that we have about where the particle's going in, where it's coming out, and how we're going to reconstruct. This, um, you know, this is a big re image reconstruction challenge. So the fact that we, each proton carries a lot of information is good. That, if you like, reduces the challenge compared with CT. But we have this other problem that they don't travel in straight lines. Um, and there are a range of approaches out there in the literature to deal with this. 
Um, the most common method of reconstructing computed tomography scans generally is something called filtered back projection. So this is what's used in, in X-ray CT generally. And the idea is you take your view of the uh, transmission through your patient or phantom from a lot of angles, and for each angle, you basically filter out for the smearing that you're going to get when you back project it, and then you, you back project the data. And this, that's a, that's a reasonable approach. This is illustrated here for uh, a simulation of this system. Now, another approach is to try to deal directly with the fact they don't travel in straight lines. And this is the approach we took in this project. And we did something called back projection and filtering. And the idea is this. You just back project your non-straight line data into an image. The image intrinsically would look blurred. And you then correct for the fact that, well, you know roughly what the uh, scattering angles are. So you can then correct for the blurring caused by that scattering. And in practice, a lot of the early CT approaches use back projection and filtering. So we're going back to the sort of days of the early 70s and early CT, if, if you like, in, in doing this. And this is what these approaches are showing here. So we've got the fact that the image actually looks fairly sharp is, is evidence that our sort of back projection filtering approach basically works. Now, what I want to do, if this will work, what we've done here is to take, um, I'll show you a, a, a movie of a, effectively a CT reconstruction of uh, the head through a humanoid phantom. And what we've done is to model the fact that the, we've effectively modeled the process of the protons interacting with the phantom and giving us a blurred set of data. We've then modeled reconstructing that. And in the reconstruction, what we're going to do is to do our correction for the blurriness. Um, what if, if I can get this to work, hopefully it will. It worked earlier, so hopefully it will work. Now, there we go. So what, I'm, what we're doing here is just for each projection, we're, we're starting with one projection and going through this whole process, then doing it for lots more projections. And you'll see what we end up with is something that looks like a standard filtered back projection reconstruction of a CT scan. But this is sort of bringing in our modeling of the proton non-straight lines and using actually the back projection filtering approach. So this is again is, is evidence that this algorithm will um, you know, be a good way of solving the problem of reconstruction. Other sort of data that we've taken to validate the approach, well, we've seen data from a single one of these CMOS sensors, but what we've got to do is to stack lots of them together and effectively join the data from each one in the stack. And this illustrates that we can do that. So this is looking at the correlations between a signal. Oh, I keep doing this. Too many buttons. Right. So what we're doing here is uh, we've got two of them, a master and a slave, and we're looking at correlations between the data that we get from them. So that's sort of showing us that we get basic good data um, combining these two sensors. This next one just illustrates the, the concept of dealing with the um, relationship between signal size and um, effectively depth well, e energy. So we start off with a, a certain energy, say 200 MeV. As the particle travels through different layers, it loses energy. So energy or depth, if you like, is, is on the x-axis there. If we have something that's um, high energy, it deposits a small amount of energy in one of these sensors, so it gives us, if you like, a small blob. If we have a particle towards the end of its range, it's going to deposit more energy and give us a bigger blob where it's interacted. And again, this is a, a combination of measurement of that, that relationship, and a set of Monte Carlo simulations to validate that. And the last is just to illustrate that we can, um, from the a tracker system based on the strips, that we can get sort of a, 
we can reconstruct something to get something that looks like the shape of a beam. So this is, this is an actual measurement looking at a 60 MeV beam at Clatter Bridge to validate that. Okay, so, so that's all, if you like, building up to the project. So the final project involved building all this, uh, all this equipment. So this is the world's largest optical bench probably to house all of this. And so what we have here, first of all, this is the, the CMOS bit. So this is the range telescope or the energy detector. So we have a stack of these inside a metal housing that are mounted on these on this optical table. Okay, so that's one bit of it. So just uh, again to, rem to remind you of that, so that's dealing with this bit. So the next bit is the, the strips and that shows us the, the strip detectors in the housing also ready to sort of go into the final system. So the current status, um, all of this is now, is, is, well it has been brought together and just recently a couple of weeks ago, Sam and, and colleagues went over to Itemba to, to get, if you like, the definitive set of data with this system. And we're in the process of reconstructing this. And this, this just, again, just illustrates using the strip detectors to image unusually shaped beam apertures, really to show that the algorithm for processing the strip detectors is doing what we want. And this really just tries to illustrate the, you know, the ultimate goal of this, we've got our, our trackers measuring input and output, and our range telescope. And this is the, the whole system assembled in the Itemba Labs just before uh, acquisition of the measurement. So it looks, if you like, the real thing looks mu much more compact and, and broad than the uh, description of it in, in this. Uh, schematic here. But this is, you know, the system ready to roll. So some early results for actually from a previous trip in South Africa. This is looking at a slightly different approach to image reconstruction. So what we're doing here, rather than um, using, shall we say, the classic approach I've shown you to proton reconstruction, is uh, Compare is taking a single strip, uh, sorry, a single strip, a single CMOS sensor, and looking at the relationship between the uh, signal, the size of the signal in that sensor, and using that uh, to form a, a reconstruction. So we call this relative stopping power reconstruction. So this is the phantom that Sam and others developed to allow this. It's a uh, a piece of perspex with a, a range of inserts of different tissue equivalent materials. What we want to do, of course, is compare um, what the proton CT looks like with the X-ray CT. You know, can we show evidence that we get ambiguous or different results with a proton CT compared with using the X-ray approach? So we have two versions of this phantom, one high contrast and one low contrast. So this is uh, first of all, this is cone beam X-ray CT, and this is what we get with our proton system. Okay, and the details of the measurement are there. So we're using 125 MeV beam with this particular phantom. And so that's the stopping power approach. Another approach is scattering power. And what we're doing is effectively looking at the amount of deflection that we see um, in our particles. And that gives us an idea of, again, of what the material content is there. And this illustrates a reconstruction of that. So this is, again, our X-ray CT with different inserts. That's air, lung substitute, cortical bone equivalent. And this is our, our scattering power CT. So again, we have you know, quite an interesting novel mode of image reconstruction here that we combine with the uh, stopping power CT. So this whole question of comparing these modalities is, is quite interesting and this figure just illustrates uh, the different kinds of uh, CT reconstructions one can get from different approaches of how we process and interpret the data. So that's a sort of introduction to the Pravda system. At the moment, as I said, the data is being analysed and hopefully 
there'll be some interesting results over the next few months showing the, shall we call it, the full uh, stopping power CT reconstruction. And this slide is really just to, illus to illustrate the tremendous number of people who've contributed to this project and to acknowledge their contribution. So thank you for listening. I'd be happy to answer any questions. <laughs>